God bless everyone. This is Rosemary Santiago from On Wings of an Eagle. We are transmitting from Casa de Fe Yahweh with Pastors Ramon and Diana Crespo, located at 104 Suffolk Street, Holyoke, Massachusetts. You're listening to DJ One, DJ One Ministries' website is djoneministry.wibbly.com. God bless David Silva and family at Spring Hill, Florida of Internet Radio Join Force International dot org and Internet TV Join Force Family Network. Salvation TV on Roku Player Channels are Uniendo Fuerza Internacionalmente and Salvation Online. DJ One TV YouTube is also of Join Force Family Network. Connect with our ministry at Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, and Bamboozer. God bless brothers Junior and Ginny Soto from Puerto Rico. You will find them at banderadeamor.org. Available on Internet Radio Join Force International dot org. On Roku Player TV, Join Force Family Network. Programs is Vere with Veronica Torres, Monday 9 to 10 p.m. Punto de Vista with Lisette Melendez on Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Mujeres de Guerra with the pastor Diana Crespo, 9 to 10 p.m. And the Spanish version, Sobre Alas de Aguila, with your servant, Rosemary Santiago. That will be Thursday, 9.30 to 10.30 p.m. And Praise Break with DJ One, Friday, 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks, Lord, for this opportunity. We give you thanks for your mercy in our lives. We give you thanks, Lord, because you always let us know what is happening before it happens, Father. I ask you, Lord, that you may glorify yourself in this message. I ask you, Lord, that you may touch the hearts. You promised, Lord, that you would touch the hearts, that you would put the desire to do the things, Lord, and you would change their stony hearts, just like you did with me, Lord, just like you worked with my family, Father. So I ask you, Lord, that this message, especially in these times, may shake up their hearts and their minds, Lord, for them to make a final decision in these end times. I ask you these things in Jesus' mighty name. I want to say hi to my granddaughter, Melanie. I saw the the picture that... um. My daughter-in-law showed me. She looks cute. I can't wait when her baby's born. And uh, I pray that she makes all the final and important decisions in her life alongside of uh, Louis, the baby that's to come. We are very happy for them. God bless. This weekend, I was listening to, listening and, 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 and visualizing also a video. It had to do with uh, all these little things that are happening in these times. And uh, it just so happens that it was in Rick Wiles' news and his invited guest was... Um, Sister Mina uh, Gebin, I believe is her last name. This woman will post certain warnings only when the Lord lets it happen. She's not one to go in every single day because she's not called for that. Some prophets, I call it the uh, cybernetic Prophets, because God has allowed us in these times, right, to use all these technical methods. I mean, it's not any surprise to Christians because in the book of Daniel, he does say that 
science would grow. And uh, no one would believe how much it has grown. Some for good, some for bad, but yes, it's growing. So we have this opportunity. Even right now, I'm making use of it. I'm in bed, but uh, my son has managed to bring what I need so I could be heard. And, you know, we have to preach in time. We have to say what we have to say. It's, that's very important. God is a loving God. This is besides the attitudes of people, because I have seen comments, and I'm telling you that um, people blame him for everything. Mind you, people are the ones that sin. People are the ones that choose to rape, to kill, to abort, so on and so on. And I was listening to her prophecy. And all of a sudden, you know, she uses the word devastation. The Lord put into her lips to speak of the devastation that's coming. Mind you, he will not tell you exactly, but he's using the word devastation. Hello, we should go into a dictionary and see what devastation means as... She pronounced that word. I went into the spirit in such a, it was almost like a screaming, wailing kind of thing. I think giving birth, like I gave birth, was nothing compared to what I felt internally when I heard the word devastation. Mind you, the Lord had given me a message to preach for today. And it just kind of like everything works in. So I'm going to do it according to the way he put it in my heart. By the way, the Holy Spirit let me always remember that word devastation. So that, you know, sometimes you go off a little, you know, off track. And so I wouldn't derail even when I'm in a lot of pain. Sometimes I have to fight not wanting to use certain medication for pain. But he put in my heart to make it or to form the word devastation on a poster. We used to call it in our times duo tags. And I would say that the letters are about six inches because he told me to put it kind of being held by the by the two mirrors that I have of my bureau. So I wouldn't forget so that even when I couldn't have a clear mind because of the pain to pray, I could at least go into the spirit and pray and ask for mercy. Because what's coming, it's not a doomsday kind of thing. That's not the idea. That's not God's heart. He never wanted or intended a doomsday message. But you know what makes the difference? We make the difference. The way we take the word of God, the way we look at it, makes all the difference of the world, makes all the difference in consequences, what's going to happen. So I looked up the word devastation, and what attracted me from that was the word vast, But before I get into the definition, something very strange happened. As I was making out the letters, I filled in, you know, with a magic marker, the the following T, the ending, shun, T-I-O-N. And I formed the T and I formed the I. So when I went back to the T that comes, you know, like in the word, D-vast, devast, vast. I noticed that I made a mistake and I and I formed it the wrong way. But when I looked at it, it was formed like a like a balance, like a scale, like something being weighed. So I took a deep sigh and I says, "Oh my god." And I'm saying to myself, "Is this me just thinking of it?" Let me ask my daughter. I says, "I turn around I, I, I show her the poster. I show her the word. I said, what does this T look like to you? She said, it looks like a balance of judgment. 
I said, I thought I was the only one. So I kept it. I kept it because I, I, I formed it the opposite. It looks like two, I would say, uh, right, right angle, uh, uh, triangles, you know, but, but, but right, meeting one to the other. And he told me, now you take and you are going to dot it out like if it was blood. So I took paint, red paint, and that's exactly the way I left it. And this is supposed to make me remember. It doesn't matter how I think. It doesn't matter how I feel. I have to remember this word that brought me into the spirit. When I cried and wailed, my daughter is a PCA to my husband. But before I got my daughter-in-law to take her place, she came in. She came in, I, I believe this was on Friday. She came in thinking something was wrong. But since I was in the spirit, I had my eyes closed. I felt when she came in. But when she saw that I was crying in the spirit, deep cry, she walked right out and she left me go on to where the Holy Spirit was going to stop and I was going to rest. I got out of bed. I went into the wheelchair, got out. I told her of my experience. I wanted her to understand that it wasn't that I was crying in pain of my body, but pain for what is to come. Okay, so I looked up the word devastation, but that word vast keeps popping out. So when I looked at it, the word devastation means great destruction or damage, desolation, havoc, wreakage. When I looked up the word vast, it means a very great extent, huge, sweeping, boundless, immeasurable, limitless, infinite. Now, why, why so much of this? Why so much of these uh, messages? Doesn't the word gospel mean good tidings? Yeah, it, it really does. It means good tidings. No one likes to hear bad news. You know, the bad news bears. No, don't come with those kind of things. Talk to me about the love of God. Talk to me about grace. Talk to me about this and that. Everybody wants to hear the good part. You know, it was amazing because she had quoted Mina, the prophetess. She had quoted something very, very powerful. And it sort of kind of rounds that thought out. You know, when Israel was waiting for the Messiah, they were waiting for a lion. And instead they got a lamb, you know. Luke chapter 22, it was necessary, right, for the lamb to be sacrificed. It's so strange because Luke was the, uh, the Gentile of the group. He was a historian. He was the one that sent out those two messages to uh, Theophilus, who apparently had a great position. Oh, excellent Theophilus. So he mentions the Lord in Luke chapter 22 as the, it was necessary for the lamb to be sacrificed. It just happened to be Passover. So Israel was waiting for a lion. They got a lamb. And the people of God, the body of Christ is waiting for a lamb, you know, God is love and grace this and grace that. That may be true. He is love. He's the perfect love that casts out all fear. But you know, everybody wants that either gentle lamb or they want a little pussy cat that they can, you know, uh, pass their hands on it real nice. But you know, you're not going to get no lamb this time. He came as a lamb. 
He already sacrificed himself. You know what the Lord said to his his disciples? He hadn't been uh, sacrificed yet. Whoever wants to follow me, they have to deny themselves. They have to carry their cross every day. This is a daily thing. And then you can follow me. He already afterwards paid the price. Nobody wants to pay the price. Everybody wants a little gentle lamb. But see, he's not coming back as a lamb. He's coming back mighty crispy. Isaiah 63. It speaks of him in Zechariah. It speaks in him in Revelations. Chapter 19. Hello, he's coming with blood-stained clothing. Read Isaiah 63 and see where the blood comes out of. Chapter 10, 32, if, if my mind is not, you know, a traitor, like we say a lot in the Spanish people. 1032, in the book of Acts, Cornelius says to the apostle, you know, I had a this kind of vision and, and this and this and this and that. And you know how he presents the Lord Jesus Christ to Cornelius as the judge? What does a judge do? Pass his hands over uh, the criminals? What do you think is going on? Why the devastation? Why does God decide to pull out the other face of the coin? Because it does say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That was the lamb. But now he's coming as the roaring lion. And when a lion has intentions of praying, not P-R-A-Y-I-N-G, praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, he's going to hunt. He has no intentions of purring like a kitty. He's coming out for something. And that's the Lord. The Lord is... You know, when, when he sends judgment, it's not because he's a bad guy. Judgment is supposed to bring people to their knees. And you know where the greatest devastation is coming? It's coming against his people. Those who started out as Christians, but they have given their backs. Why the devastation? Because of the deception. You know what deception means? Duplicity. Double dealing fraud. Trickery. Treachery. He's coming back crispy. Because there's a lot of deception. He's coming first to judge his people. It's like a mom and dad. They discipline their children. When they're out of line. I'm not talking about the, the, those that rip their kids apart and kill them. Or fracture their skull or anything like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those who discipline. Discipline means teaching their children. This is wrong. You can't do this. Do not touch this. Do not eat this. Do not place your hand. This is hot. That's exactly what the Lord is trying to do. For the longest time. You think he's a bad guy? All this perversion. All this killing. All this raping. What is he supposed to do? Pass his hands on you if you're in sin? You that have a mom and dad, you remember the times when you weren't supposed to do something. They told you in different tones. The very last means was that little spanking. You didn't die over it. You're still here. It was good. And the idea of this is that 
we have a God that's so smart. He is the designer of our intricate body. He puts a lot of padding in the in the backside. And a hand that even if you you hit a child in the backside, that's going to hurt you just as much as it hurts your child. Because you're going to have to pull back. It hurts your hand. And you know that if it hurts, and it hurts in both of you, but something's got to happen. It's not going to keep going. So you're going to pull back your hand. I'm not talking about those that pick up a stick and ram the heads of their children. I'm not talking about that. Or these people that throw hot water or bathe them purposely. With I'm not talking about criminals. I'm talking about parents disciplining. So what makes your parents better than our creator? When does he use his sovereignty? When is he going to speak up and say, okay, this is it. It's enough. I've had it. You've heard your parents say that. I can't take it no more. It's time that you change. That's what our creator is trying to do with humanity. Everybody in the church, those big growing churches, you know, everybody glorifying themselves. Now he says, it's my time to glorify myself. When Pharaoh was being looked as if he was a god, and God comes into the issue and says, wait a minute, it's my turn now. I'm going to glorify myself. I'm going to prove to you that I am God. Nebuchadnezzar, he forgot for a while why Babylon was great. It wasn't great because of him. It was great because God gave him the chance. He became the king of that kingdom. And one day he made a very big mistake. That's in chapter 4 of, of the book of prophet Daniel. He's telling his story. He says, uh, uh, it's about time. I'm going to tell you my story. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened to me. He even says how, how an angel uh, spoke in the dream to warn him. And he says, and I made the very big mistake. He said in the dream, in the vision, I was going to be like a beast. Well, guess what? I lasted seven years as a beast. It was God's time to glorify himself. And that's what people forget. The church forgets, the world forgets, and everybody glorifying themselves and everybody trying to, you know, be the person. Look at me, spotlight me. We find it in the government. We find it all over. So now it's time for devastation. The Lord does not want to be the gloom bearer. The Lord rather that we know our place in society, in our home, on earth. He doesn't stop being God because somebody's a fool. He doesn't stop being God because somebody kills the other person or because they're prejudiced or because there's abortion or prostitution and all this garbage that's going on at the same time. He doesn't stop being God when you got pain. When I have pain, he doesn't lose his position. These are things that take place here on earth. There is sin. Sin produces people's brains to go off to do the most ridiculous things. A lot of people are judging and putting God into judgment. And they're going to find out who God is. And it's going to be very, very soon. Let's talk about deception. Let's see what the word of God speaks of. Who's the origin of deception? We all know. There's people praising him in these times. There's people bringing this image of their God to the front, the 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 very outside of Washington, D.C., because you can find that, right, in Internet. 
We're not allowed to preach the word of God. We're not allowed to pray. We're not allowed to have the Ten Commandments, even on a plaque. But Baphomet could be formed and he could be placed and people can accept all these ideologies and concepts and beliefs, but not Christianity. Strange, I think we we serve a humorous God because in DNA he welcomes the inhabitants of earth and he makes it clear that he is the only God. Uh, this has nothing to do with your beliefs in your um, made up whatever gods. Now you see, and you're going to see it once the devastation comes up, who is the real God? Let's look at Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of of the pits on the 17th it says that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners here he's talking about the king of babylon but lucifer is not the king of babylon all you gotta have to do is look into history and see all the names the assyrians and Babylonic names, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar was the last one ending the 70 years of Babylonian kingdom before the Persian Medes came in. Oh, you know, the word of God teaches all that kind of stuff. But the name Lucifer, the first deceptor, Lucifer. And look what it says in 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 11 to 15. And here, Apostle Paul is talking to the Corinthians in his second letter or the second epistle. He says, Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion that wherein they glory they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. What he's arguing the issue is about those who with subtlety, they go into the churches. Then when you hear bad news, real bad news about church members, then they say, oh, mind you, and those are Christians and they say they love God and look what they're doing. It's so strange because Satan plays a lot with the minds. With those who are not Christians, with those that are within the church of Christ, and you have to be very careful because not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, belongs to the kingdom. It says, and no marvel, you shouldn't be surprised. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The strange thing about it is the minds 
within the church. Remember, I said judgment was going to come first to the body of Christ. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is of his. There's a lot of uh, drama going in. There's a lot of people that have not had a personal encounter with God. They don't know him. Why don't they know him? Because if they knew him, they would know exactly what his love letter speaks of. He does not hide anything from any of us. The word of God, it tells you, it reveals everything that he likes, that he doesn't like, that is an abomination. He explains every issue. Nothing is let out. And the most amazing thing is how people could deny him as God, deny the word and not know that everything was foretold before it happened. Anybody can tell you anything afterwards, but hundreds and thousands of years and it was foretold everything that we are seeing now. And especially what the Lord said, that there would be a time when everything that is good will be called bad and what is bad will be called good. And it's so hurting. There's a book called Lamentation. And I think Jeremiah was lamenting really and truly more about the condition of his people. Why did they have to go through exile? Why did they have to go through that? Because they were sinful. Because they did not honor God. Because they were doing idolatry. What's the difference between that time and today? There's more idolatry. A house, a child, uh, a profession, even a belief. Now they're idolizing a belief. You don't even have to form something into a statue to be idolatrous. What about sports? And there's really nothing wrong with sports. But hello, what is the word fan? What does it mean? It's not an apparatus that gives out air. Fan is a shortened name of fanatic. What are you a fanatic over? You are idolizing something. You are idolizing humans. You are putting a human before God. I am the Lord thy God. There shall not be anything before me. He says that he doesn't share his glory. And especially not with statues and forms. What do you call Baphomet? What do you call all this Shiva? What do you call all this... I don't know. They look so icky. They are so ugly. They are formed so ugly. There's nothing beautiful about them. Some of them are blue. Some of them are formed of uh, elephants. Some of them are formed of rats, of snakes. And you ask yourself, what can they offer you if they are not real? You know, the Lord says, you know, if you call upon my name, I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. His secrets, he reveals to man, to humans, so that we can do his will. So that we can do the will of the Father. So that we can glorify all that he's done. A lot of people don't understand that him being sovereign. He can be three in one. If he wanted to, he could be a million in one. That's his problem, his choice, his sovereignty. Who is going to be a vessel and tell the one that forms him how he should be made or what should he do? Why does God have to explain things to anybody for that matter? We are dust. If we're not dust, how is it that when we die, we go back to dust? The only things that you might see are the structure, the skeletal structure. You're not going to see anything else. Maybe the hair, the teeth, if you have any. 
how is it that people have the audacity to say what should be truth? We're living in time of deception. The biggest liar is Satan. He's the father of lies. He originated lies. Look at Second Thessalonians. 1 to 4, then 8 to 12. Let's see what it says. Second Thessalonians. New Testament for those who do not know how to, you know, find their things. You have an index that will help you. And since we have Bibles, the day that we are before the Lord, there's not going to be any, any excuse. And for those who say, I don't know how to read, I don't know how to, how to write, there's audio. You can hear the word of God being. That is the, the biggest, how would you say, gift that God has given with technology. If you don't own one, who doesn't own a, a, a cell phone or a tablet? It used to be a rich man. Now everybody gets it. Even schools supply it now for their students. There's no excuse. And anyway, in the very beginning, Adam and Eve tried the excuse scene. The serpent had no excuse. He couldn't look back and say, you know, uh, the devil made me do it. He was also cursed to drag in the dirt. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 to 4. It says, now we beseech you, brethren... By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. There's another deception out there. And you have people that used to be called brothers, Christians. They're saying that there's not going to be a rapture. I don't know, but this is very clear. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together Unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Mind you, if he was feeling that, it was at hand. Because the attitude about whether you go in the rapture, whether as dead or as alive, Everybody's waiting for that rapture, waiting for that time. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Are we not seeing that? Are we not seeing Judases all over the place? Are we not seeing people all of a sudden after so many years decide that the word of God is a lie, that Darwinism is true? Are we not seeing and hearing this all over the place? And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now he says in 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In his time, they could tell the difference. I'm going to show you what the Apostle John says. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. For the longest time, the church has been saying that it was the church, but it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here as the comforter, and he has a job, a personal, intimate job with the body of Christ. Even the Lord said that many would be deceived. And the reason why the very elect had to be taken out is because something would happen where, where they might even be deceived. How many people that started believing the Lord, his word, is now given their, you know, their back 
8 to 12, it says, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an sample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. What is he talking about? You have a lot of people that are making money. Money on brothers. There are many brothers within the churches that really and truly think and they're eating the wrong kind of foods and they're being taught the wrong kind of things. And these people are sucking on them. And yet when a man of God, a woman of God comes along and tells of the truth, everybody criticizes. But you know, that's another thing that's not very surprising. Because the Lord says, you know, they persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. And persecution doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be bodily persecuted. But just how I have seen for myself, I have been a witness of it. When I go into uh, certain people's channels, people that I know, that I know, that I know, that, because the Holy Spirit tells me, these are people of God, they are prophets of God, and how so many people comment against them in such a trashy, trashy way. You can expect that maybe from someone of the world that doesn't know our Lord, but for those who call themselves brothers in Christ, and use many times the idea of grace. Grace means that you didn't deserve getting what you got. You didn't deserve to have eternal life. The Lord Jesus Christ paid a mighty price. And it's being trampled on. The prophets are being trampled on one way or another. People are coming together, they're conspiring, they're inventing things against these men and women of God, and we have to be very careful of it. I praise God that I don't care what people say. I am doing His will. That's my job, whether in a bed, on a wheelchair, on crutches, with a cane, whatever. I speak what I have to speak, like or not like, that issue should be brought, you know, before the Lord. When you don't like what somebody says, ask the Lord if this is Him speaking to your heart, or ask the Lord why it bothers so much. Because if I'm not mistaken, not only in the book of uh, Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, and the book of Revelation where both of them were told to eat the words, that, that book. One is a book, the other one is a scroll. But they were told to do the same thing. And it just so happens that with the Apostle John in Patmos, it says that when he swallowed it, it was bitter. Now, something that tastes good will never be bitter to you when you like it. But something might be bitter to you when you don't like it touched a little area that you didn't want it touched. Do you know that one time I had a pastor? I think he was in a car accident. He had an infection. While he was in the hospital, his stitches had gotten infected. So... The nurse was forced to squeeze and take that out. It was very painful. He hated it. 
And he used to complain all the time. But she was saying that if I don't do this, it's going to get worse. And usually when something is for your good, it hurts. Something that is good for your body maybe might taste a little nasty. But it was made to do you some good. And that's why the Lord feels that it's necessary. We are in the times of deception. Let's look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4. 4, verse 3 and 4 it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. You know what's the scariest thing of all? They're the ones with the itchy ears. They want to hear, they want to do something different. So you can look into those videos and you will see how they merged things of the world to attract what they're really saying between the lines is that the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, who came into this world to admonish, to work on your mind, to give you conviction. He's not good enough, but you as a human got a better way to pull in. The thing is, is that anything that is not of the word of the Lord is adultery, spiritual adultery. And it's like mixing oil with water. No matter how you shake it, no matter how pretty it looks, they separate, they go their ways. They cannot mix. Then you have Second Peter. Here, let me go to first. Timothy 1 3 what does it say okay let me go back to this before I go to the next one it says they will not endure sound doctrine they won't be able to put up with it that's what it really means they don't want to hear it no matter how you say it they will not accept it okay let's go to first Timothy it says as I be sought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. But why is that? Let's see in chapter 4 it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. I think that's pretty clear, right? They're cauterizing their brain. And okay, there's some forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. That is very mild. That That's nothing. You know, like Fridays, fish, eating on a Friday in, in, in a so-called uh, sacred time. You know, that kind of thing. But you cannot forbid anyone to marry. Because there is a natural law. Be fruitful and multiply. And now you notice with these kind of operations and uh, the clonings and all this kind of stuff. How now a male can give birth because they're, you know, they're defying God. They're putting their law, their perverted laws, you know, up in his face. It's easy when you haven't met the other side of God to kind of defy. But remember the word devastation. If ever you paid attention to that word devastation, God is going to show you what he's talking about. And this has a very important function. 
It's not because he gets kicks out of destruction. It's the same issue with the time of Egypt and uh, showing the difference between uh, Israelites and the Egyptians, where no longer were they going through the same kind of plagues. And then you have in the book of Ezekiel where it speaks of certain beings that were dressed in linen, where they were called for to separate. And to put a sign in the foreheads, just like the repetition in Revelations, where the 144,000 are going to be separated and sealed. No one will be able to touch them. Uh, my friend, this is going to happen. It, during that devastation, there is going to be a difference between those who really believe and respect the sovereignty of God, the only God, the creator of the universe and every law that exists. There is going to be a showdown because God is not unfair. Abraham knew this. He says, oh Lord, you know you're not going to treat the just with the unjust. Because then anybody would have the right to say, hey, you see, I told you, God don't even take care of his own. Well, some of his own are going to be sacrificed and some of his own know that they're going to be sacrificed. Some of his own figure that if people could die for a lie, they will die for the truth. It's going to happen, but they will have their recompense. We are only promised now. We are not promised tomorrow. I could be talking to you right now. I could be leading you with this message, with prayer. And I could be taken in a matter of seconds. Because I don't control death. That is God's legal right because he is sovereign. During the time of devastation. We are going to see that the Lord is the only Lord because there is only one God and one mediator between God and man. It has nothing to do with what you believe. It has to do with what the word, true word of God says. Hey, I'm going to read the last one before I lead anyone who wants to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because this is one uh, part of the scripture that is so, so vivid, so plain. This is so that nobody uh, gets the idea that, um, you know, that they can believe in whatever it is they want to believe. It says in Second Peter chapter 1, Verse 19, 21, it says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. The one that has to arise is not Satan in your heart. The one that has to arise is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why millions of Muslims have had visitations of the Lord Jesus Christ. And millions of Muslims have decided to serve him. It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Whose spirit? Why holy? The Holy Spirit of God because it's God himself. It was his spirit that inspired. Now before the devastation, you can make the right choice. And it's so simple to ask God into your heart. And if really and truly you want to serve God, 
I invite you right now, just follow and repeat these words. God, I don't know you personally. I ask for forgiveness. I accept your word. I accept your son's sacrifice. And I ask to be cleansed of my sins through his blood sacrifice. I ask your Holy Spirit to guide me to the right church. And I ask you that you may write my name in the book of life. I ask you this in Jesus' mighty name. Something as simple as that. That's how simple it is to talk to God. Just come close. Father, in the name of Jesus, I praise you. I glorify you, Lord. I ask you, Lord, that you may heal spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, and socially, Lord. You're a complete God. We can come close to you. We are loved by you, and we feel our salvation, Father. This is something that you have done in our lives. It has nothing to do with us. All we need to do is come to you, Lord, with confidence. This has been Rosemarie Santiago from On Wings of an Eagle. Look for God's guidance to the right church. You don't want to fall into that devastation. You don't need to be punished. I praise God. Today I was able to do it from my bed. And I bid you a God bless.